Hello, welcome back to Stalin Origins, the podcast in which we look at history and how it can influence what we do today, how it has influenced what we do today, and how it can improve the way we design instruction to improve others' performance. I'm Alex Salas, your host, and today's topic is on the role of interest in learning and development, particularly learning what does interest do and i think a good way to paint this picture is sort of think of yourself as having a favorite musician everybody does right you like music you have a favorite artist in many respects when you find someone that has a favorite artist they tend to have way more knowledge and way more information about that person and what they do and their craft as well and their history and so what can we attribute that to i would say that we can attribute that to interest so there there's quite a bit of a rabbit hole to go into here the discussion of interest last goes way back even to the 1800s but primarily uh, we have some good mentions of um, Charles Rickinson Allen and Charles R. Uh, Prozer, who were the fathers, let's say, or the main characters pushing for vocational education at the turn of the century and the Industrial Revolution here in the United States. So that is an interesting uh, uh, notion. There is a book called The Vocational, uh, vocational Education in a Democracy. And there are some powerful quotes in there and some observations that are made about the role of interest in people's learning. Primarily, they mention how folks that get involved in vocational training or vocational education are already in the occupation. So pretty much a good parallel, uh, a very good parallel with corporate training. And we see how they attend, they attend classes because they're interested. They have an interest to attend the class, to attain a specific skill and achieve what it's called as occupation mastery. I guess no different reason, no different purpose than when you or I go and get a certification, for example. You have to study a subject, you have to demonstrate certain skills or in many occasions, cognitive skills and passing the test as an exam and being certified. The main point there is that we can look at it in different ways. One is that you're learning more, of course, that you're developing in learning, but also that it has some, some prospect that by achieving that certification, that will lead you to a promotion, that will lead you to better opportunities in terms of attaining more and achieving more in your career or dedication. So in the chapter of vocational education and human resources, this I think is something that every learning professional should read, especially if you're in instructional design or if you're in organizational development. These two gentlemen laid a foundation of training. And I mean, we know from the first episode from Charles uh, R. Um, R. Allen, the first episode, which talks about this foundational book in training and development, the instructor, the man and the job. And so that was published in 1919. This, this book specifically actually is published later, which is around uh, 1929 or so. And it's in collaboration with the two folks. So Prozer and, um, Alan. And so there is a part here in the chapter, and I quote, for most people, the strongest interest factors are connected with earning a living and therefore with securing an occupational mastery. In vocational training, the average individual on account of his greater interest secures a more effective training of his thinking machine than he does in other fields or subjects where the occupational incentive is lacking. So it's a powerful message there if you think about it, because think about your experiences going through school, through high school, through academia, 
general subjects, perhaps not really specialized or hitting one place or another. But I think the most important part here is that you think about what subjects or what skills you learn through your academic experience that truly you shine the most in and then reflect on that. Was it based because you were, you had a, a good interest in developing those skills? You find yourself in a good experience, but is it the combination of those things, right? So we know from Thorndike back in 1930s, as well as early 1900s and uh, Dewey, that experience and positive experiences in learning lead to more of that experience. Now, as you, you repeat the experience, you'd like to have that experience again, or you continue to further your experience. Well, when it comes to interest, when we think about interest, there's a discussion always between curiosity and interest. And I would say that curiosity is the spark you know, where something arouses your attention. And then based on the experience you have with that something, whether you want to find out more, whether you want to do things, you develop more interest in it and, and it grows into this passion. Which means that if you, at least in the way that these two authors saw it, if you have interest and if you have captured the person's interest, which is really sort of related to relevance, then that person would do way better. Those learners will excel at what they do. And the reason would be probably not just because of the external factors, meaning the environment, but their in intrinsic motivation. So they were actually, that person would actually seek out more knowledge outside of that formal training and will look for ways to learn more, look for people they are, have experience in that subject and learn different angles of that subject. I would say in my own experience, what I found really helpful as well is not only to do those things that I just mentioned, but also to sort of look at the opposite view of that practice. As to say, for example, if we say, well, inst effective instructional design is A, B, C, and D, then look at something that says, that's not correct. This is the different angle on that. It's A, B, C, E, D, and then C. Again, so it's uh, it's helpful to do that because it challenges your thinking, um, your thinking process, and it helps you uh, achieve something as they call it self-regulation. So you self-regulate in what you know, and you can achieve what people consider to be metacognition, meaning what you know about what you know. Do you really appreciate what you know? And I don't know a lot of people have problems with that, right? Because that leads to what we consider to be imposter syndrome in the way that you know things you do well but yet you have this internal criticism of your ability and you don't believe in it so all of that i think is very linked and very powerful in what we want to achieve with our formal approaches so in the study of interests in learning there has been like I said, it's a rabbit hole. There are many different angles. There are tons of literature to tie in and break in and even instructional design models that sort of hint or touch on it or speci specifically address it. There's a very interesting book called The Role of Interest in Learning and Development, which is actually the title of this episode. And as you probably know already, right? But What's interesting in this book, uh, we have the differentiation of two types of interests, and they're noted as individual and situational interests. And uh, in page six of this book, uh, quote says, generally researchers linking them to dispositions that develop over time. Individual interests are considered to be relative relatively stable and are usually associated with increased knowledge, positive emotions, and increased reference value. Situational interests, on the other hand, 
are generated by certain stimulus characteristics. Example given is live themes, novelty, and tend to be shared among individuals. Close quote. So I think a good example of this whole thing between individual interests and situational interests may be a popular subject today, which is chat, chat GPT, right? And AI. These concepts have been around for over 70 years. In the previous episode, if you caught it, I had a good discussion with Myra Roldan, a good friend of mine, and she is one of a very interested individuals, lack of a better term. She has individual interests in AI and machine learning because she works somewhat closely related to that as well, but she is a tinkerer. Like me, we like to look at different technologies. We like to explore and see what use we can have in what we do. So that's individual interest. No one is making us go look at things. No one is, no one said to us, hey, take it, take this class and now just get dedicated to find out more about it and what, what it could do for us. There is situational interest, and this is probably what many other people are experiencing, which is the information and the trends that happen in society where now they're saying, well, AI is going to take your job or AI is going to compromise your ability to earn a living. And that is a situation. So you will be situationally interested in learning more about how AI will impact your job because obviously it is affecting your living. It can potentially affect your capability to earn a living. So a situational per se, perhaps then you find out that it's all hype and then you realize, huh, nothing to worry about yet, right? And there are probably many other examples of that. What is situational? What is individual? But I would say individual is something that sparks your curiosity and something you decide to look on, not with the pretense of earning anything else or doing anything else, just for the fact that you love the thing and you find it interesting. You are motivated to find out more about it. Then if we look further ahead and we get now into the 80s, 1979, 1983 or so, we have the ARCS model from John Keller. So Professor John Keller puts out this model. It's called the ARCS model and stands for attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. And so we'll break down a little bit of what those stages of those phases of that model mean, but also the, the actual essence or origin of this model comes from earlier theories developed in the thirties by Tolman and Lewin, uh, Tolman 1932 or so, and, and Lewin 11 in 1938, excuse the pronunciation. And it's the expectancy value theory. Which is basically what I sort of mentioned earlier, which is that we tend to do many things that we tend to do professionally is because they have some kind of relevance or let's say expectation value out of it. There's a nice uh, journal article called Development and Use of the ARCS Model of Instructional Design. In other words, how it was developed and how it's used by Mr. Keller himself. And he mentions there that the expectancy, quote, well, expectancy value theory assumes that people are motivated to engage in an activity if it is perceived to be linked to the satisfaction of personal needs, the value aspect, and if there is a positive expectancy of success, the expectancy aspect, close quote. Now, breaking down the stages, we're going to think attention is about, you figure, right? Attention is... If you go back to classrooms, is someone paying attention? If you remember uh, Robert Gagné's conditions of learning, out of that you get the nine events of instruction, and obviously the first step or the first event that you need to really conquer is gaining attention. But attention can be gained in different ways. Obviously, you you can clap your hands and make a noise, and people will pay attention to you, or you can paint a picture, tell a story. And people may be more engaged by the details of that experience. The important or 
fascinating piece here coming from Keller is that he does mention that attention is not enough and the real challenge is to sustain attention and that is usually done by achieving and maintaining strong interest in uh, in this specific activity or goal so again interest comes into play here and interest is a big part of the attention phase of the arcs model relevance obviously as you can imagine figures to or attends to the relevance of the instruction or relevance of the learning experience many students maybe when you were in high school you were wondering okay pythagorean theorem why do i have to learn this like what do i care uh why am i learning about something else or something else right so if you ever questioned that then you know there was a lack of relevance or perhaps it wasn't explained to you that there is a relevance to importance now let's take this to the actual work environment many of the things that you that are new usually represents represent the change in work and that may be already a challenge for someone doing the work and then if training needs to be involved because a new process a new system something new is being implemented that will be part of the occupation of a person then that has to be really expressed well in terms of relevance so people need to have that relevance now keller also talks about relevance in ways that are a bit different he talks about a um, need for affiliation. So some people need to work in groups. Some people need to, so it tends to be more of the sort of the learning experience or how people like to, let's say, from previous experiences, learn. And that seems to be relevant to the learner. And that's an interesting take. Never consider, you know, didn't quite consider that. Although the many of the practices or the good practices we have in instructional design sort of a so to address those things so group discussions you know in adult learning have to be they're pretty much an essential piece that needs to happen one way or another to clarify gaps and to clarify different discussions so it's an interesting thing to to see relevant in that aspect but it all lines up when we just also discuss relevance in content if it's in a school or relevance in skill if it's in the workplace Confidence is the C in arcs. And well, confidence, as we can tell, it's about feeling that you can do things, feeling that they're not um, out of your grasp and they're not um, so difficult. And uh, Carol Dweck, who has worked on the concept or the model of theory of um, grit and the theory of uh, growth mindset, uh, has also written about this and one of the things is uh, confident people tend to attribute the causes of success to things such as ability and effort instead of luck or the difficulty of the task supported in one of her papers in 1986 and um, as well as uh, Weiner so this is something that you know Keller uh, quotes in his paper as well all the links in the description of the episode and you can also find them on the newsletter that we publish every week in on LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn, or if you are on LinkedIn, follow me and subscribe. You don't have to follow me, but you can subscribe to the newsletter and you'll be notified when the newsletter is published. One of the main uh, observations also made by Dweck is that in contrast, uh, unconfident people often have more of an ego involvement they want to impress others and they worry about failing so i guess confidence is a good building confidence is a good thing and i guess some people can come in with more confidence than others in terms of a learning experience and then uh the last one of course is satisfaction so satisfaction is an interesting one it's sort of based on reinforcement theory and that people should be more motivated if the task and rewards are sort of defined and you achieve those tasks. So it's hard to say because there are different contexts, right? But satisfaction, I guess being satisfied, it's well, 
in the way that you are performing, which kind of aligns to your uh, kind of like a feedback loop into interest. So the more interested you are, the better you do, and the better you do, the more satisfied, and the more satisfied, the more interest you will have. So I guess the question that we have in learning and development is that is that how do we capture people's interests? And I think there are many approaches out there, but I think a, a good way to capture people's interests is perhaps getting to know people and what is it that drives them. Uh, I don't know if that's been something that has ever been done or you experienced in your organization. I certainly haven't, but I think asking people what would they do if they didn't have to do the job they're doing? You know, let's say if you didn't have to pay bills and you didn't have the job that you have to do, or let's say the job that you have, what would you do? What would interest you? What would motivate you? What would be the thing you do? So I think it's directly connected to things. I know you heard, you heard the expression, if uh, if you love what you do, then you never work type thing. But we know that, you know, uh, work is work sometimes. And yeah, there is a passion. There's a little bit of love, but an interest. But there are things that will be more interest, uh, more interesting in one way or another. So there are mentions of many different related concepts with interest and interest remains I would say my quote on this will be that curiosity is the spark, then interest is the flame, you know, and there are some elements needed to maintain a flame, just like a fire needs to have oxygen and combustion, some other components, right? So the, one of those things is intrinsic motivation. So internally, what moves you to learn more and intrinsic motivation seems to be related or defined has been defined as uh, to be self-motivation of an individual who regulates his or her behavior without any external control. And that comes from a paper from uh, Motas in 1985. Then curiosity, and this is an excellent paper that I have here as well by uh, Serkan Denser from a university in Turkey. Uh, shout out to folks in Turkey. Hopefully, the prayers are with you and everything. Is, uh, things are getting better there. We have a uh, also a statement of curiosity, which an individual has towards learning and pleasure of success, are also identified as intrinsic motivation in the education of sciences, and that's supported by several different articles, and also including. Keller's 1983 revision of the ARCS model. So there are different factors in there. And to keep that flame alive of interest, then we need those different things in play. There's ex extrinsic motivation, obviously. And extrinsic motivation are perhaps things that happen externally, whether it's being directed by the designer, the training designer, or the instructional designer or the experience or to the environment itself. You know, we can think that if you go to college, the extrinsic of motivation is the continuous achievement, the GPA and the title or the graduation of that program. And when it comes to workplace learning, extrinsic of motivation will lead probably to those primal um, situational interest factors we mentioned uh, earlier, which lead to your capacity for living and your ability to achieve promotions. Um, so those are sort of external motivators. And there's also intrinsic motivation there linked up or sort of overlapping because you want to do better, right? But if you want to do better or you want to engage in something, because it leads to another thing, then that becomes more of a situational thing. So it's a very intricate thing. It's, it's an interesting thing, lack of a better word, but learning interests is a key factor. 
for anyone to achieve things. Now, does it mean that you can't learn if you're not interested in things? Of course you can. You can demonstrate some kind of ability, at least if you think about it. We all went through school and we're not going to kid ourselves that every class you took was phenomenal and you were totally interested in it. Sometimes you had to do something. You had to take a specific course to do so. And you were interested or not interested in it. In my personal experience, I had um, quite a bit of a quite a bit of a, a retrograde per se, per se uh, earlier in life. What I was taking from a private school system, I, and this is another country, Venezuela. I was taking from a private um, private school system into a public school system, and. And it's a public system that was in a poverty in a poverty place. Not that you know meant anything, but there was a big gap on things. So I did experience, and I mean, obviously, I only reflected on this after being an adult. Not something I knew as a kid or realized as a kid. I was always very naive as a kid. So I, I was uh, I was feeling great. I was getting, I guess, false motivation because all the math problems seem easier for me but the reality was that i was working at a at a better level or elevated level in the private school and i was not doing as well and and you know so i was working at a lower level in that public school in that poverty uh, ridden area and and so it was sort of i guess false reinforcement so that also changed my and then after that i actually went to another public system that was more advanced than the other two institutions even the private one so the expectations were way higher so that if we look at it from the arcs perspective kind of affected many things for me and that kind of put some limitations growing up in terms of my interest towards sciences or let's say math or chemistry, algebra, things like that, which are things that I today find interesting from my perspective, but yet, you know, don't really spend that much time doing it because of utility or because of relevance. So what is interest to you? Have you ever thought about it? When you learn, does interest play a big factor? Is it is it something that you actually or actively think about? On, on learning and how to affect your learning. I guess those would be the big questions to think about, and you are welcome to leave a comment if you're listening to Spotify or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you have the ability, look in the page. There's always a place where you can leave a message. If you're on the Art Anchor site, there is a button that's called Messages, and you can actually leave your voice message and share your opinions and share your, your thoughts on it. I'll be glad to publish that or if anything you want to contribute to this episode i'll be glad to uh, publish that on the next episode but thank you for listening that's been the role of interest in learning and development and hopefully you got some good information out of this episode